Okay. So <clears throat> this particular presentation is on resolving nuisance wildlife issues. So I've had a few folks, master gardeners and otherwise, um, tell me over the, the course of the last year or so that, um, you know, they're having some issues with wildlife and, uh, you know, in suburbia, it is a thing. Um, unfortunately, with, um, with people encroaching on uh, animals' habitats, we're going to have animal-human interactions. And a lot of us aren't aware of why we have those interactions or how we can um, eliminate some of those interactions. So sometimes people like visits from deer or from squirrels, but they're not as happy when skunks come and dig up their yard. Um, or you have a coyote that maybe unfortunately gets an, a, a pet. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about all of that and how we can hopefully eliminate that. So some considerations. Um, and if I get a little, I'm having to also admit people from the waiting room. So I apologize if there's sometimes a lag in what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're going to talk about the importance of um, wildlife to us and how they interact in our sphere. We're going to talk about what nuisance wildlife constitutes, a little bit about laws and regulation. I've got some contact information in here for um, DNR and the folks that take care of that. Um, and just a reminder, if you've come in, please mute yourself. Um, so that uh, I don't have to wonder who's talking. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the different types of control methods and different types of common nuisance wildlife that we see here. All right, so why is it important? Well, obviously you wanna avoid human wildlife conflicts. Here we've got a bear that's looking in somebody's window. On the northern side of town or the northern tier, so upper uh, Gwinnett County uh, into Fulton, Cherokee, all of that, you see bears occasionally uh, all the way into June and July. So, um, you know, that is definitely a thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about others, less so about bears, but uh, they, they are a problem here in Gwinnett County occasionally. We also wanna know how to protect ourselves, protect our pets, protect our property from property damage, and of course, to protect the wildlife because they were here first. So we need to be able to coexist. And, um, you know, ultimately having non-lethal means is to me, um, a professional that deals with this stuff on a daily basis, a lot better than having to go lethal. So defining the term of nuisance, uh, that's going to be a person thing or circumstance that's causing annoying or inconvenient behavior. Uh, we've all had, you know, that uh, raccoon that's gotten into the trash can or something like that. Uh, sometimes there's a possum that gets into the garage where you've got pet food for your cat or your dog. And, you know, that's really annoying. And so that that can constitutes a nuisance. But it can be other things. So, you know, it could be destruct destruction of crops. Uh, so if you've, you're you getting squirrels in your garden that are eating your tomatoes, that counts. Damage to homes and structures. Squirrels that chew into your attic and are living in there. Contaminating food stores. So if you've got pet food in um, the garage and you've got mice in there, that, that works. Um, can, uh, you've got building nests in our homes. Mice again, rats, squirrels in the attic. Uh, occasionally raccoons in the attic, preying upon pets and livestock, coyotes fit that bill, and uh, occasionally black bears, disease health and risks. Um, there are zoonosis, zoonotics or uh, diseases that are transmissible between humans and animals. Um, so sometimes that's an issue. Rabies, ra it rears its ugly head occasionally. Venomous bites with snakes, animal attacks, so sometimes coyotes, um, raccoons, again, sanitation concerns. You certainly don't want, uh, you know, animals pooping about your house outside where you can walk in it, step in it, that kind of thing, or in any food, damaging landscapes, uh, voles, moles in your yard, and damaging recreational fields. That's a high dollar. So you definitely don't want them there either. Same thing with moles and voles. So terms and definitions. 
So commonly used and misused terms. So we'll talk about native. So that's a plant or an animal um, that's indigenous or it's been here basically since before 18 something or other. Um, a good example is a flathead catfish. So maybe there's some folks out there that like to go fishing. So flathead catfish are actually native in the Northwestern part of our state. We have different geologic regions here and that geologic region is vastly different than the one that we have in the Piedmont area and then down in the coastal plain. Uh, so flathead catfish get really big and anglers like them. And so a lot of times what anglers will do is they will pick them up when they catch them and move them to other bodies of water because they think it will improve things. It does not. Uh, there's probably a reason why it was not in any of those drainages to begin with. And then they soon find that the fish they liked to catch, mainly sunfish in the southern part of the state, are no longer there because the flatheads have eaten them. So there's a, a reason. Um, Non-native something that's not indigenous or native to a particular place. Feral hogs are an example, the snakehead fish, uh, Nor Norway rat, and the feral horse. So those lovely ponies down in Cumberland Island, not supposed to be there. Invasive, this is something that spreads prolifically and is undesirable. Um, and even harmful to the environment. So a lot of times we talk about this in a, in a sense with a plant, kudzu being an invasive, uh, Japanese stilt grass being an invasive, those are all invasives, but it also carries over into the animal kingdom. And so there are plenty of those out there, uh, that being the feral hog, snakehead, you know, most of you aren't gonna know about snakeheads, but uh, they do occur here and there. There were some found um, along the Chattahoochee and the Norway rat. So uh, people who have horses know about those and um, they're really difficult to get rid of. All right, so <clears throat> you don't have to answer, um, but in your head, what do you think that these are? Um, no reason to even put it in the chat box. You know, you're not gonna get tested on it. So what do you think a coyote is? So these guys, um, nobody brought them here. They just kind of found their way here on their own. They're invasive. <clears throat> armadillos, the nine banded armadillo. Uh, a lot of people don't like these guys. They dig in the yards looking for grubs and worms and other things. They're gonna be an exotic pest. And then this cute little black bear, he's native. So yes, we do have native black bears here. So if you're a master gardener and you're on here, you heard about the hurl model when you were going through training. So this is an IPM or integrated pest management approach to nuisance wildlife. And the HURL model is just simply an acronym that's used to talk about habitat modification or harassment of wildlife, exclusion, repellent or lethal control. Okay, so that's just what that means, HURL. It's just a, an easy way to remem remember that. So we're gonna go through all of these different types um, of um, ways of, of getting rid of nuisance wildlife. And then we'll dive in a little bit more about to the types and all of that. So you might be wondering why isn't trapping and relocating on here? And we'll talk about that here in a second. So um, as you noticed in some of my past presentations, I've started using QR codes. Uh, I record these and I think that this is probably one of the easy ways. So as you're sitting at home, if you want to use your mobile phone and look up any of these links, you can certainly do that. It's pretty simple and easy. And then as it's recorded, you can just pause it later um, and hover over and get that um, website. So if you want to check out invasive species of Georgia, uh, you can hit that QR code and then the USDA National Invasive Species Center is there. And then that gentleman, um, so that used to be something I did in my past. I was a fisheries biologist. He is holding a flathead catfish. They can get really big, um, really big. They are good eating though. All right, so laws and regulations. Um, who owns wildlife? Well, that's a good question. So basically we all own wildlife. That doesn't mean that you can go out in your backyard and collect them and do whatever you wish with them. Um, but you can check out the Georgia code here. And that basically says, says that all wildlife is held in trust. 
Um, and so for hunting purposes, you know, we have regulatory agencies, um, you know, you can read more about that later if you would like. So the unlucky, um, these are the animals that you can basically get special permits to remove at any time. Coyotes, freshwater turtles, rats, mice, armadillos, groundhogs, beavers, nutria, that's going to be in the southern part of the state, feral hogs, venomous snakes, frogs, spring lizards, fiddler crabs, again down by the coast, freshwater crayfish, and freshwater mussels. Um, so yes, you can remove venomous snakes. No, you cannot non-venomous snakes. And so I understand a lot of folks don't know how to tell the difference between the two and we end up with a lot of dead non-venomous snakes, some of which are endangered. So um, I do caution everyone and I try to educate folks. There are better, more non-lethal ways of getting rid of snakes. Please don't kill them unless it is a direct threat to you. They are usually more scared of you than you are of them. So complexity. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into deciding, uh, you know, is this nuisance? How can I remove it? Um, how many can I remove? What kind of permit do I have to get? It's there's just a lot that goes into it. Uh, Canada geese, and it's not Canadian, it's Canada, Canada geese, uh, typically are migratory, but here in Georgia, uh, they had, and we'll just, you know, I'll go into the trivia of it because it's kind of interesting. So they used to be, uh, you know, endemic. They were here long ago, um, native, if you will. And then in the 70s and the 80s, the, the populations really started to decline. So they are considered migratory. They are part of the Migratory Bird Act and they're protected. So you're not supposed to hunt them outside of certain seasons. But as they started to uh, drop a population, DNR decided they were going to stock geese. So they stocked some geese and those not being in this particular area, but being from a different flyway, uh, they decided they really liked Georgia. And so now they hang out year round and they don't migrate, uh, which is a little bit confusing and um, you know sometimes they can cause problems in golf courses or if you live around a lake or uh, something like that and they make a big mess and you can see them now they're grazing uh, hanging out sometimes they'll hang out with the migrators but uh, they they like it here they stay year round so <clears throat> if you have more questions about that you can check out these contacts with for a hunting license special permits uh, for removal of nuisance wildlife and um, this is the phone number for the game warden for Gwinnett County with DNR. All right, identification. So when you're trying to figure out what you have, a lot of times we'll get calls and people will ask, well, I've got this hole in my yard and I need to know what that is. So I have a handy dandy little um, paper on my wall that said, what, what size hole is it? And therefore, what could it be? Uh, so sometimes it's measured in inches, sometimes um, less than an inch, sometimes up to four inches. But you want to kind of ask, what is the problem? Where is it, first of all? Is it in your lawn? Is it just in uh, an area of soil? What's the damage look like? Is there an upraised area or is it just flat? What are your concerns? So what kind of damage is it going to incur? Is it on a golf course where you have lots of money and you don't want that kind of damage? Or is it back in the woods where it doesn't really matter? What have you tried to get rid of it? And can you send pictures? So those are always good things that if you're trying to help somebody like I am, these are the questions that I ask to try to get to the bottom of what I'm looking at. Um, if you're a property owner and you're just trying to better your own knowledge, uh, you obviously don't have to send pictures because you're there. But the other questions are things that you can use to slowly eliminate what it could be that's causing the problem. So you look for evidence. So here's a deer. Um, you have some <clears throat> um, some scat, and then you can look at the footprint if you uh, have a stream area. Uh, we don't have wolves here, but we do have coyotes, and so you can compare a coyote paw print to a dog paw print. Um, you have some vole tracks where they've crawled along in the lawn. That's kind of in the middle and the bottom. Um, you have, you can have grub damage, which is down lower left and Japanese beetles, of course, um, they're a big problem in mid to late summer. 
So control methods for nuisance wildlife. <laughs> so there's all sorts of different control methods. Uh, these are what we'll talk about. So exclusion, exclusionary um, methods, keeping them out of stuff, cultural methods, uh, habitat modification, frightening agents and repellents, toxicants, fumigants, and trapping and hunting. So exclusion. So, you know, using this picture here, I'm sure you could figure out, you're just trying to keep them out of something. So in this case, it looks like we've got blueberry bushes and we've got netting over the top of those to exclude birds from feeding on them. So you're gonna use things like fencing, electrical fences, vent covers, mesh nets. Um, and there are some animals that there's really no practical form of exclusion. Uh, the black bear is one of those. Sometimes you can use an electrified fence if you have maybe honeybees or something like that. But a lot of times they just bust through. Uh, so you have to be really aware of what's causing the problem and trying to figure out what the solution is. So fences, you can use a diagonal fence, you can use a double layered fence. This is speaking mostly to deer here. And so deer, you really have to have something that's gonna be, if it's a vertical fence, probably more than 10 feet, 10 to 12 feet. And they don't like to jump wide distances. So if you are if you know about deer, you know that they have an issue sometimes with depth perception and they don't like going over wide expanses. Uh, you can also do some psychological, mess with them psychologically. So you often can have a solid fence and then you can um, put some wire or even fishing line uh, above maybe from that five foot up to about 10 or 12 feet. They can't figure out what that fishing line is and they don't want to jump over it or through it. So a lot of times they'll just ignore it and they won't go in because they can't trust that they're not going to get tangled up in it. The diagonal fence, Again, they don't like jumping over that spread. So you can sometimes, if you have a diagonal fence like that, and that'll keep several different types of animals out, um, it's it's a, a good way to uh, keep you know certain animals that would destroy your property or your garden out of there. Exclusions of electrical fences. So again, these are good for a wide range of animals. You may have some much lower, you may have some much higher than you do. Uh, so a lot of times gardeners will um, use a solar fence or sorry, a, a solar charger, especially if you have a garden that's um, gonna be fairly far away from um, your, uh, sorry, my cats are getting a little <laughs> irritated and chasing each other. Um, You'll have a, a solar charger if your garden is really far from the house and um, that if you want to keep deer out, if you're having a deer problem and they're breaking through an existing fence, you want to put that about chest height on the deer. You put a little bit of uh, peanut butter on. Um, so, um, and again, just a reminder, please mute yourself as you come in. Um, you put a little bit of peanut butter on some aluminum foil and that will get them used to the fact that they don't want to go through that electric fence. Uh, if you have turtles, uh, you might put that electric fence a little bit lower to keep them out or rabbits. Um, sometimes people have a very low electric fence or raccoons here that you see. Uh, you can also see here with a coyote, you can do that. There's a couple different ways you can keep coyotes out. They can jump. So I, I always tell people when you've got coyote breeding season going on, do not let your little dogs and cats out at night. Um, it can get really bad and you may not see them again. They will jump fences uh, up to six feet and they will also dig under. So sometimes an electrified top portion is a good idea. If you have um, cattle panel or a lower fence, a coyote roller, which is just simply a wire, and you run um, a piece of PVC over or through that wire through there and attach that so that as that coyote jumps up and tries to scrabble over, it hits that um, PVC and it'll, it'll roll and it knocks the coyote off. So if you live um, maybe near a greenway or something like that, that might be a, a good idea. Exclusions for vent hole covers. So this is gonna be for birds and bats and things that like to fly down your uh, into your, your chimney flue uh, or and or to keep things out of maybe your crawl space. 
They're usually vent holes on your crawl space and of course up in your chimney. Um, sometimes those covers get knocked off if you have you know, windstorm or something and a branch might knock it off or you've got a, a dryer hole. Um, putting something over the top of those is a good idea. I have gotten calls from snakes in your dryer vent, um, raccoons living in your crawl space. How do you get those out? And then of course your birds and occasionally bats that are in the chimney. So you always want to make sure that whatever you're doing, that you're putting hardware cloth or whatever covering you have over that is going to exclude all types of wildlife. Bats can squeeze into tiny little areas. And so when you have some of those vent covers um, up in your attic, you want to make sure don't ever let that screening material on the backside fall off. Maintain that because those bats will get in there and um, that costs a lot of money in cleanup. Mesh nets. So you already saw these. Here you have um, some grapes and you've got the uh, mesh net over the top of it to exclude the birds so that they don't take all of the harvest. And those mesh nets, those bird nets work really well over just about any type of fruit. So you might have a few blueberry bushes and you're trying to exclude the birds. Um, you can come up with a little frame like you've got over here to the left. Um, you know, just be mindful that you might end up with some dead birds. So, um, you know, I try to <laughs> encourage folks plant more than you think you'll need and just let the animals have some. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about uh, accidentally killing some of the animals that you were hoping just to exclude. So cultural methods. <clears throat> um, so you can do a, a variety of things to um to keep animals out, uh, nuisance wildlife out. So you can plant deer resistant plants. You can store food in sealed trash, can, trash cans or other types of containers like pet food in your garage. Um, you wanna maintain your compost systems and don't add stuff on the no list because all you're gonna do is attract animals that wanna come eat that. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but you want to not do that. So there's a reason why there are things that you're not supposed to put in your compost pile. And you want to maintain those landscape, that landscape area and wood piles around your house. I know it's tempting to leave some areas as natural areas. The county encourages that and the parks. Um, that works for a park. Might not work when you only have a half an acre lot and you start getting voles and other critters, chipmunks, and things that are now coming into your garage, and then you get some snakes, and then you're calling me asking, how do I get rid of the snakes? So um, yeah, there are def definitely things that you can do to um, control what comes into your yard. All right, so cultural methods with plant deer resistant plants. There are so many deer resistant plants. I've got a couple um, examples here, ginkgos, uh, muley grass, yarrow, uh, but we have a, a nice little deer tolerant ornamental plants publication that was put out by extension here in UGA extension. Um, you can just hover over that and you can get that publication at your leisure. Don't have to do it now. Remember, I'll upload this onto the Metro Master Gardener YouTube channel. You can go check it out later. So storing food in sealed containers, this is specifically garage or shed or something like that. There's a lot of stuff in there that you forget about. Um, sometimes you would just throw stuff in cardboard boxes and that's not a really secure way to keep stuff away from mice and other rodents. I get a lot of calls from people saying, I've got snakes in my garage. They're there looking for the food. They can smell the rodents. So uh, make sure whatever you're doing if you're storing pet food out there, if you're storing bird seed, get yourself a nice secure container that the rodents can't get in. If you're storing Christmas decorations out there, including Christmas decorations that might have, you know, something in there that the the uh, mice might want, little sometimes you see millet uh, or other stuff that's going to be in wreaths, uh, nesting material, food, put it in a plastic box and cover it up. You got to exclude it. Um, and then for those who maybe live in Northern Gwinnett and occasionally see a bear, <clears throat> you can during certain times of the year when you're more likely to see that bear, 
uh, it makes sense occasionally to buy some of those temporary um, bear proof systems that you can put on your trash cans, especially if you seem to have problems year after year, if you live near a power line right of way uh, or um, other greenway area that will help keep them out and other animals out like raccoons. Maintaining your compost system. So I mentioned that there's a reason why we don't want to put those no items in there. So obviously plant cooked items and trimmings are just fine. You can put those in there. Um, compostable paper products like your coffee filters, shredded papers, um, paper plates, paper towels. You can do that if you want. Some people cho choose not to do that. Uh, the things that you don't want in there that are going to attract those nuisance wildlife to your property, don't put meat, french fries, fish, um, milk products, cheese, um, anything with a waxy color, chips, that kind of stuff. Don't put any of that in there. That's just going to attract animals and that includes um, pizza boxes, things that, you know, you may say, oh, well, that's cardboard, right? I can put that. Well, if it's got soaked in grease and cheese and other stuff, it's going to attract animals. Uh, they all live here. Most of them are used to us and they could care less that you, they live in the tree out behind your house in the middle of a subdivision. So you just don't want to have any opportunity to have them in your house or in and around your house because they're just going to make a mess. Um, there's a higher likelihood of an interaction between you and you know, we just don't want to do that. So no, don't do that maintaining landscape and wood piles. So that's another biggie. We get a lot of calls from folks going, I've got snakes or I've got armadillos or, you know, I've got chipmunks or rats. And I start asking them questions like, well, what does your yard look like? What do you have in your yard? What do you have in your garage? Um, and, and so these are the biggie, big areas that we want people to be aware of. Do you have any hollow areas under your patio or your, your uh, driveway? you probably have things living under there. Snakes like to live under there. Snakes like to hunt things that live under there. Um, if you've got a wood pile because you burn firewood, there's probably mice and chipmunks and maybe some snakes that are living in there. If you have it against your house, you might have those there too. If you have bricks or you know other piles of building materials or something in your yard, um, they can live there also. and um, please go ahead and mute yourself. And if you have a house that's overgrown, maybe you inherited Uncle Bob's house and uh, it hadn't been taken care of for a while. So the grass is really tall, like you see in that picture there. It's probably got some animals that are living in there. Maybe something as simple as a, a fawn, you know, and a deer, but it could be snakes. It could be you know, a whole variety of things, probably things that you don't want anywhere near you. So just make sure that you maintain your landscape. And if you can, um, and you need to have a wood pile or a stone fence or something like that, try to locate that farther away from your house so that any wildlife that does live there is not tempted to, to come in closer to where you are. Habitat modification. So <clears throat> things that we suggest to folks, to get animals to move on. Um, again, you don't have to immediately go to lethal control. There are things you can do, such as removing sources of food and water. So if you have a bird bath, move the bird bath away from the house. If you have a hollow area underneath your patio, fill it in because you might have, you know, rodents that live there, chipmunks, uh, other burrowing types of things. You might have a snake there. If you remove the, the habitat where they're sleeping, then they'll move on. Uh, if you get rid of the grubs and the um, earthworms in the lawn, you may have fewer armadillos. You may have fewer skunks. You may have animals that <clears throat> normally trappers can charge upwards of $350 for removal. That's currently what most of them will charge to remove an armadillo. Uh, you can save yourself that cost by buying some grub treatment and putting that out, watering it in very well, and you'll kill off the grubs that are in your grass. No more armadillos because there's no food. So that's what we try to recommend is try to figure out why they're there. And once you know why they're there, get rid of whatever it is that they want. And that's usually water, food, or a place to sleep. 
Okay, simple. You got to figure out why they're there. Um, and if you're not comfortable or you don't know, that's why we're here at Extension. We can always help you with that. And then, of course, eliminating the shelter and locations, clean up the landscape, and then pruning. So we'll talk about each of those. Um, so be careful about how you feed your animals. We know a lot of people like to feed deer. Don't do it, please. Really. Um, I cannot express enough how bad that is. Um, it'll, if you start feeding wildlife and that could be anything, I've seen videos posted of people putting dog food out there for whatever comes around and then videoing it for the views. Please don't, don't do that. If you're going to feed your animals outside, only put enough that they can eat in a short period of time. You're going to attract unwanted wildlife. Again, that's going to promote possible interactions between humans and animals. Um, it may end up with, you know, a bad ending for your little dog. If that coyote comes in, it, it just in increases those chances of you coming in contact. Um, it, it can create dependency. Uh, it artificially increases the carrying capacity. So that's a fancy word that we use both in, in fisheries and wildlife, but that basically means that you're feeding that animal enough that you're increasing its condition and allowing it to reproduce and survive past the ability that it would be able to do that in its normal habitat if there was no human intervention. So that means if you have, if you're feeding the deer um, and you want to have a, light, a nice garden, the chances of that are going to decrease exponentially because you're bringing in deer. You can't hunt deer for most of Gwinnett County because um, you know, you've got too many subdivisions now. So those deer can move about pretty much however they'd like, and there's plenty to eat. So if you think it's cute to bring them into your yard uh, with corn, don't do it because they're gonna eat, they're gonna reproduce. And then if there's too many of them, then they start eating your, your grass or not your grass, your hydrangeas, your hostas, everything else. Um, didn't used to have a problem even in the driest part of the year, which is now, but now I have to get a motion to um, activated sprinkler to keep the deer out of certain parts of my yard because uh, there's just, you know, too many of them and not enough food, na natural food for them. So it disrupts the natural environment um, and can cause problems. So, um, you know, think about kind of who you're really feeding. And so that can be deer, that can be birds. We'll talk about the birds in a little bit. Um, but really, it's just a bad thing all around um, for wildlife. I mean, it's one thing if you've got a little bit of chip, a few chipmunks that are kind of running around the base of your bird feeder. Um, but when you start ending up with bears that are eating out of your bird feeder, when you get coyotes that are attracted to the rodents that are eating off the the uh, bird seed, um, you know, you're affecting the whole food chain. So you have to kind of be aware of that. Uh, so what about your bird feeder? Um, you know, things to consider your feeder type, the location, the surroundings of it, the accessibility, the de defense and the food type. Sometimes people don't think about the fact that they're attracting birds. Um, and so what's higher than then those songbirds are hawks or, or um, birds of prey. So if you've located your, your feeders out in the open so that you can watch them, you probably have also attracted those birds of prey. And sometimes people get really upset about that. Um, just know you cannot um, euthanize uh, or use lethal techniques on those. They're protected. Um, so here you have a couple of QR codes. You can check these out on your own later. Um, so the Yankee, what is the Yankee flipper? Um, one of those twirling spinner feeders. Those are kind of fun. A greased pole and then uh, the squirrel baff baffle. So uh, you can um, use particular products in a, a wise way. So using black oil, sunflower seeds, you have less um, less waste. They're really expensive, but you get less waste out of that. A lot of times birds will kick that seed, the millet seed, and the other stuff they don't want onto the ground. And then of course the rodents move in and they start eating that. Uh, you've got voles and then they make damage in your lawn and around your uh, landscape plants. It's a problem. So you can also do suet feeders. Um, the suet feeders can feed a wide variety of birds. They make all sorts of different kinds, um, different recipes, that kind of thing. 
Um, so be smart about how you're doing it. Don't always go for the cheapest seed. There's an alternative. Um, if you could uh, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, so eliminating shelter locations, cleaning your landscape, mow your grass to an appropriate height. Most of you, if you live in a subdivision, that's not going to be a problem. You'll get a nasty gram in your mailbox if you don't do that. Uh, but those of you that maybe have some property, keep that in mind. If you're around the house, you want to keep that grass pretty short. Okay. Uh, John Stockton, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Keep your islands mulched, but as the proper way to do that, make sure that mulch is not up against the trunk. Uh, you're inviting voles if you do that. Make sure you pull weeds, get rid of the debris piles, like I mentioned. Try to avoid using ivy, English ivy as a ground cover. Most everybody knows that's kind of an invasive. If you bought a house that had it, you know, I feel for you. <laughs> um, try to keep it at, as far away from your house as possible. It's a good place for snakes and other things to live. And then, of course, removing dead trees and shrubs. Pruning. So squirrels will use trees as an effective way to get into um, and around the eave area on your houses. A lot of sometimes they'll uh, chew through your soffits and fascia area so that they can get into your attic and make a cozy little nest for themselves. Uh, raccoons will also do that. And um, so will rats. <laughs> so lots of things want to live in your attic. It's a nice, safe, warm place to be in the wintertime. So make sure if you have trees that have limbs that go too close to your house, um, that you're pruning those branches um, so that there's not a, a really easy way for those animals to get there. Um, a good rule of thumb is like 12 to 20 feet. I do understand that squirrels can jump that far, but the bigger animals usually do not. And uh, that goes for branches that overhang your roof as well. So uh, it makes sense periodically to go ahead and have a company come out and do that for you. Please don't climb up on your roof and do that. But keeping things away from your house so that they can't, the animals can't get there and then chew into your house is, uh, you know, well worth it. It can cost a lot of money over, you know, probably like twelve, fifteen hundred dollars to try to do a cleanup in an attic if you've got squirrels or rats or something living in there. So frightening agents and repellents. <clears throat> um, so I know there's a lot of stuff on the market. Some of it works. Some of it doesn't. Um, I'm not going to go over every product here. We're just going to kind of talk a little bit about the different senses. So smell, touch, sight, hearing and taste, and how some of these, a sampling of um, these different types of products, what senses they're hitting. <laughs> so um, frightening agents and repellents. So they can be pretty effective. Um, some of them are, if you know what they are. Again, if you have questions or you have a particular product um, you have questions about and you wonder if it's effective, you can always search that product and then put extension at the back. And, or you can put, if you have a particular animal that's causing a problem, you put the name and then extension on the back. And you'll usually get some articles on proper use of agents and repellents and what works, what doesn't work, that kind of thing. Or you can just give us a call and, um, you know, every situation is going to be unique. So, you know, if you call me and you tell me you have squirrels in your attic and you want to get rid of them, I'm probably going to ask you a series of questions about, do you have trees nearby? Do you need to do some pruning? Um, you know, have you found the hole where the squirrel is getting in? Have you, and then how do you exclude that squirrel? Well, then you have to know the biology. So during the daytime, they are out and about. So during the daytime, you're up there putting some type of exclusion material on so they can't get back in. Um, there's a whole way of going about it. So visual deterrent. So some of us, we see these owls or birds of prey and people will put them places that they want to keep birds away. It doesn't really work. Um, you know, it's a visual deterrent, but if it doesn't move and it doesn't, you know, cause those birds like pigeons or something else to be 
you know, afraid of them, it's not going to do anything. It just looks like, you know, another one of them. So, but it is a visual deterrent. So just kind of keep that in mind. Sound. Um, so you can use an air horn that's going to cause birds to, to try to run away and get away because it's, it's kind of frightening. It's not something that uh, they're going to expect. And uh, when they don't expect it, they leave. And so you need to use something probably about three weeks in order to form a new habit. So if you have a flock of birds that, that come pretty regularly and you want to get rid of them, you can use that air horn. You have to be pretty consistent again and, uh, you know, to get rid of them. Lights, a lot of animals don't like lights. So motion, motion activated lights, that's a visual deterrent. Um, and you can use a variety of different methods. Um, you don't have to use just one. You can use several different types. Motion and sound. We've all seen the pie pans around our garden to keep the birds away, fluttering in the breeze. So that's both a visual and it makes kind of a clangering sound and they don't particularly care for that. Birds don't. So uh, sometimes that will keep them away. Um, fertilizer. Sometimes the type of fertilizer you use is a smell deterrent. And uh, malorganite is one supposedly, you know, that keeps deer away. There is some effectiveness to that. Mothballs, naphthalene, uh, the smell is a deterrent. I know they say that you can use it for snakes. Um, you know, I've not seen them keep snakes really away, but, um, you, you know, there is some thought process that essential oils like peppermint and things like that are very strong and that scent keeps them away. Just keep in mind that as it rains, uh, those scents will lessen in intensity and you'll probably see them again. And then there are some like um, capsaicin that uh, squirrels don't like. And so you can use that. That's a nose and um, deer aren't a big fan either. So taste. And motion. So motion activated sprinkler. That works for quite a few things. So deer, uh, it'll keep deer out of your garden. Um, if you want to check out that little video, there's a QR code that'll link to that. You can watch it on YouTube and uh, see how effective that is. Works on cats, stray cats, or cats you wanna keep out of a particular area, and a lot of different animals. They don't like getting blasted in the face with water. So it is a pretty effective and non-lethal method, and it works for a wide variety of animals. It's also a visual deterrent. Um, so the startling reflex with the water coming at them, uh, they just don't like that. And the sound is a little disconcerting. You can use animals. So Great Pyrenees, those are, are good herd dogs and llamas. Uh, donkeys could be in here too. So if you have livestock, uh, know that there are some options, um, you know, that you can mix animals in with your herd that don't like predators. And uh, llamas and donkeys hate coyotes and they will uh, take off after them and stomp them to death if they can get them. <clears throat> so you can put those in with sheep or goats and they'll do a good job or horses. And those great Pyrenees, they're great all around dogs for just about anything. They'll protect uh, chickens, goats, sheep, horses, whatever. And they're very sweet. So some myths, you know, I mentioned the mothballs and then you've got some of those ultrasonic type repellers. Those don't work. Uh, the snake stopper, you know, I, 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 I'm more of a proponent of figure out why they're there and fix that and they'll go away instead of trying to buy something on the market and hope that it works. So use the psychological advantage of knowing why they're there and then get rid of that problem, get rid of the food, get rid of the habitat, whatever it is, move that, get rid of it and they'll go away. Almost always that's what works. Toxicants. Um, be aware they're non-selective. So rat poison, be very careful because if you've got an animal in the house, a cat or a dog, if they get rid of that, or sorry, if they get into that, or if they eat a rat that has been in contact with that and died, so too will your animal. So I really, you know, try to suggest to folks, figure out why those animals are there and get rid of that so that you don't have to use something that's going to be lethal. Uh, it's just, it, you know, it's not good. And then sometimes you get an animal that'll, I had one that died, not from a toxicant, but died um, 
in a hole down by my basement and uh, it got warm and it stunk and nobody had, nobody could go in the basement for about a month and a half because it smelled so bad down there. Um, we filled that hole in, so we don't have that problem anymore, but yeah, there's, um, there's other options. Same thing with fumigants. Um, you know, sometimes people will try to use them on moles, uh, subterranean animals, but, um, you know, it's really hard to get these to work because obviously they dilute quickly and it's hard to target or pinpoint areas effectively. Trapping and hunting, um, again, should probably only be done by a licensed wildlife removal specialist. You can buy these traps. They do sell them at um, Tractor Supply and you can get them online. But what are you going to do when you catch it? That's the problem. Um, so you have to, to really be aware of that. And, um, you know, I, I always try to, to, to steer folks to the DNR list, um, so that you can find somebody that actually, um, knows what they're doing and knows how to properly remove these animals. Um, unfortunately, most of them, if you, if you catch them and you don't want them on your property, you you can only relocate them to other parts of your property. So if you have a big 40 acre parcel, that's fine. If you're on a half an acre, it's not so fine. And in that case, there is lethal, um, you know, that is a lethal mesh method. They're going to basically kill that animal. So just be aware of that. If you want to take care of that animal, make sure that you understand you probably have to have a special permit or you have to do it during that particular season. So you can use this QR code and you can check that out. Um, apparently I misspelled DNR, that should say DNR, not DNN, um, but you can check out uh, the laws and the regulations that they have there with that QR code. So relocating, that's what I just said, you're not supposed to do that. Um, <clears throat> why not? It seems like it should work and it should be a good thing, but not necessarily. So each of these animals has a territory. Um, they have a, a tighter home range and then, um, you know, a smaller territory that they move around in. When you move that animal um, and put it someplace where it's never been, it, it has no idea, you've probably dropped it into another animal's um, territory, that's going to cause it a lot of stress. It's not going to know where its food source is or its water. It might get, you know, killed by the other animals that are living there. Um, so, you know, don't, don't move something. Don't, you know, catch it in a trap and then go take it down the road. Uh, if you don't take it far enough, it could find its way back to your house. Uh, sometimes animals have a really wide territory, like a possum. Uh, possums are, you know, if you dump a possum less than five miles from your house, it'll find its way back unless it gets uh, hit on the road or something. So just be aware that that's probably not the best option. So if you, again, can help move that animal on, that's probably the best thing. So types of traps, you have lethal and non-lethal. So I mentioned before the non-lethal um, snap trap, and that's usually how it's a live trap is what it's also called. Um, you know, you can use them for cats. Some people do that if you're doing trap neuter, um, trap neuter release. Uh, you can do that for raccoons, possums, all sorts of things. Uh, again, that's, you're not supposed to, to drump, dump those animals um, anywhere but your own property. So please keep that in mind. And lethal traps, so glue traps for mice or rodents, snap traps, uh, then there's all sorts of other meaner traps like leg traps and things like that. Um, you know, I didn't put any of those there. Those should be used by a professional, but most of us are going to be familiar with the ones that you see here. And then, of course, sometimes you have bigger animals like bears. And, you know, there are lots of nuisance bears. So if they start figuring out they can get in the trash or they can bust into the bird feeders and they start getting habituated, they're dangerous. You don't want those around your house. So in a case like that, DNR usually will come in and they'll set up a bear trap. Um, in the spring, we're not really in, a, a, we're only on the outer edges of, of their range. So they don't particularly care for suburbia and people. 
they're going to be in more rural areas and most of the bears that you see here are going to move down from areas up in the mountains they've been pushed out by um, they're usually the young of the year cub that's been pushed out by mom after she has her next baby. And so they don't know where they're going or where their next meal is coming from. They don't have their own territory. So they just kind of wander and they will eat anything. So they'll bust into your grill or your trash or whatever, whatever they can get into. And they can cause a lot of damage and they can cause, um, you know, a lot of worry too, because people don't want to walk out to put the trash in the can and see the bear. <clears throat> so just know that, you know, in a case like that, uh, other than keeping those things away so the bears can't get to them, you probably need um, to actually get some professional help. And you can find that at that QR code. Hunting. So, you know, there are still a lot of people that hunt and that's perfectly fine. I am a proponent if you're going to eat what you kill. Um, <clears throat> but illegal hunting can be a serious crime. Uh, we do not recommend that. Uh, make sure that you're following all of the rules and regulations, that you're hunting during the correct season, that you're hunting in the correct area, um, that you're not doing it off your back deck when you're on a half an acre property. Um, there are some people I know that do that. It's kind of gutsy. Um, you could be shooting into your neighbor's house. Don't recommend that. So if you're not sure what you need to do or you have questions about that, you can reach out to Georgia DNR and they are more than happy to direct you to the correct resources. All right, common nuisance wildlife. Let's cruise through this. So venomous snakes, um, you're going to find mostly around this area in Gwinnett County, it's going to be the copperhead. You might in some of the um, areas where you have like a granite outcropping, you may see um, a rattlesnake, but probably not. Those are gonna be more up into the mountains and then more South Atlanta uh, out to Mansfield area. There just aren't really a lot of those around here. Um, <clears throat> they're gonna eat rodents and um, birds and anything else they, um, they can find and get in their mouth. Um, if you have a nest of juvenile, Co or um, copperheads. And um, I'll just talk about that because that's the snake that I have there. Um, just know that most of the, the young snakes that you're going to see do not have a way to regulate venom. So if you are fishing into a, a, you know, a shrub to try to pull some weeds, that's not a smart thing to do if it's that season and we have juvenile snakes about because you may end up in the hospital with 15 vials of antivenom in you. So uh, just be very aware and it makes sense to use a, a rake handle or something like that to kind of put that around in there so that you can, um, you know, alert whatever might be in there if you can't see it to get out. So we usually recommend in that case, get rid of the food sources. So in the garage, get rid of the, the dog food, the bird seed, that kind of stuff. Make sure it's locked up so you don't have any rodents. And the chance that that snake moves on is pretty high because it's there for the food. And always, <clears throat> I try to let people know, respect the animals. They're there. They've been there before us. Uh, they're there because they're hungry and you have something for them to eat in there. So if you get rid of that, then those snakes will move on and you won't see them. They'll be out in their normal habitat. They won't bother you. Occasionally they move through but you can use a garden hose to move them on, uh, a rake, whatever. As long as they have an out, a way they can go, usually they will move on. So please allow them to live their life just like any other animal. They don't look a little scary, um, but just respect them. That's all we really ask. So these are the big six that you would see in Georgia. We've got the cottonmouth water moccasin. Um, those live around water. We don't have a lot of them here. We're really on the edge of their territory. You'll see them more down to the south again and then up into the north, similar to the rattlesnake, um, the eastern diamondbacks um, range. Coral snakes are going to be down in the southern part of the, of the state. The mimic here is going to be a king snake. So if you see something that looks like that, uh, and this, the saying um, red and yellow kills a fellow, is not 100%. So sometimes that's not the case. 
just respect the snake, just spray it away. Um, and it'll go about its business and do its own thing. Um, if you are out in the mountains and you're hiking, just be aware, especially in the spring, that those uh, rattlesnakes might be out there as, as well as the copperhead sunning themselves. So just be very aware if you're out in their territory that they're around and, uh, and then respect them. So non-venomous snakes, they're not really nuisance, but they're there. We always get calls in the spring when they start moving around. People find a non-venomous snake and they kill it and they send me a picture missing its head and then they ask what it is. And I have to tell them it's non-venomous and it wasn't going to hurt them or do anything. And sometimes I have to tell them that they just killed an endangered snake. So I know they're scary, but please, please, please do your best to let them be. So again, modifying the habitat, getting rid of the food, getting rid of the, the place that they're sleeping. That's what we want to do. We want to remove that um, and make it not fun for them to hang around and they will move on. Not to mention the fact, again, it's illegal to kill a non-venomous snake. It's really, really bad when it's one that's endangered. And so here's how you tell them apart. And if you want a list of all the different snakes, you can check out that QR code that's got a list of all the different types of snakes. But this is how you tell a non-venomous to a venomous. It's not poisonous, it's venomous. So um, this is how you tell. And most people are like, I don't want to get that close. You can take a picture. Uh, generally speaking, though, they're going to pretty much the venomous snakes are going to have a triangular type head, uh, whereas the non-venomous do not. Uh, they also have the round pupil, whereas the venomous have the slitted pupil, and um, the scales are slightly different, although I don't expect you would get close enough to do that. Um, but you can get good enough that you can usually tell from a distance. And, um, you know, there are some that are drama queens, and they get all crinkly and stuff like that, and it's kind of funny. But if you don't like snakes, just walk away. <laughs> That's probably the best way. All right, armadillos. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, they used to be in South Georgia. They slowly and steadily increased uh, moving north. And now they're up into Kentucky. So if these guys are hungry and you have grubs and earthworms in your lawn, they will do a lot of damage digging that up. Uh, they'll also dig up in your garden. So just be aware of that and um, know that if you eliminate the grubs in your lawn, you can treat with a pesticide and that will eliminate them. The little guys will move on and you'll save yourself a lot of money because the wildlife um, removal uh, specialist will charge about 350 per armadillo. And unless you remove the food source, they'll come back. So uh, also note that fencing will not necessarily keep them out. They can dig. So. Norway rat, they like to live around humans. They'll eat pretty much anything and they can cause a lot of damage. People with horses in a barn, um, they can tell you a lot about that. You'll find them dead in the water buckets. They're just, yeah, contaminating food with their feces, just a big problem. Um, they don't typically live in structures. They live in holes, excuse me, burrows that are away from structures, but they spend a lot of time in those structures. So um, figuring out where they are and, and note that, again, if you're going to use a toxicant to deal with these guys and lethal control, that if you have other animals around that you may have collateral damage. There are some ways that you not uh, that are lethal. Uh, there's the bucket method. And, you know, we can always kind of help you with that. But uh, there's different ways that you can go about removing these guys with traps and things like that where you don't have to use a, a toxicant. Deer, I hate deer. <laughs> um, they're all over the place and they are not afraid of humans. And they will come into your yard and munch your hydrangeas and your um, pastas and everything else. And they'll do a lot of damage. And if you're artificially increasing that population by feeding them, you just have a bigger problem. And now we have... Um, you know, some diseases that are coming in and, you know, that's going to cause a problem, especially if you have a higher population or you're all bringing them in to where they're feeding on corn or something else, you're actually going to cause probably more mortality because you're bringing those animals into close proximity to one another. So um, it's actually better not to do that because uh, there's less of a chance that they would come in contact since really that only happens uh, during the rut. 
So again, exclusion, habitat modification, uh, hunting, um, which is lethal, of course, and um, repellents. Eh, you know, some people are thinking soap keeps them away. It really doesn't. Um, it just makes your soil soapy. So just give us a call if you have questions and we can help you figure out a system. Raccoons, yeah, they're cute, but they uh, are very opportunistic and will tear stuff apart. So just, um, you know, beware. And again, keep things in metal trash cans, seal it so they can't get in. Uh, they will kill your chickens if you have those. They can have rabies and they can cause all sorts of nasty um they have sometimes you can get uh, parasites and things if they're living in your attic uh, with the feces, just bad news. Bears, again, only a problem here in the spring in the northern part of the county, but occasionally you can get structural damage if they want something in your car, food. Uh, they're very opportunistic. They'll rip your grill apart. Uh, electric fence is, is really about the only way to dissuade them. But, um, you know, you can try some things. Mostly they're not that aggressive, so it's not going to be that big of an issue. But um, better to stay clear if you see one. Moles versus voles. Many of you are like, well, you know, it's an M or a V. What is it? So moles with an M are the little guys on the left. Their holes are, as you see there, they're a couple inches. They'll have tunnels. They tend to feed on their insectivores, um, so worms, grubs, um, other insects, things like that, whereas the voles are vegetarian. So V for vegetarian vole and moles, and they're eating insects and worms and things of that nature. Um, those are the ones that can do the most destructive force to a golf course. And <clears throat> typically, you know, most folks are looking for a quick fix, and so that's a lethal trap. Um, there really aren't many toxicants that work. We can provide you with publications. And voles, we tell folks, mulch and other things around your plants. Give those little guys a very easy way and access to the roots of the plant. Um, so if you have a beautiful hosta plant and you, you're looking at it and it's lovely and the next day it's wilting and you walk over there and you grab it, you pull it up and there's no roots, you have a vole. So um, there are ways that you can um, trick them into coming out of their burrows that are lethal using a rat trap. We can help you with that too. So here's using one of the mole traps um, and then that's a vole trap on the bottom. So you can see some of the ways that we use to get rid of them. Uh, coyotes, they're all over the place. They will eat your little kitties and they'll eat your little puppies and they will tear apart a bigger dog. Uh, during breeding season. So they're very opportunistic. They will eat whatever they can find. Um, they are, um, I mean, dog food too. So just be careful. Try not to leave that kind of stuff out. And squirrels, they get into your attic. Um, they can cause a lot of problems. If <laughs> I had one that when I lived in a rural area, it got into the phone box uh, where the wires were and chewed it up. Uh, so they can be, you know, a, a problem. Most people don't worry about them too much until they get into their attic. Feral hogs, we do have them around here. They're probably more prevalent up in the mountains and down on the southern part of the state, but they can cause a lot of problems with the rooting that they do. Woodpeckers, uh, anybody that has wooden soffits and fascia on their house, I'm sure has had one of these problems. You get the carpenter bees up there. Uh, they're hammering on those boards to try to get the grubs out. Um, they're really annoying. <laughs> but again, they're protected. You can't do anything with them. So please don't do, don't try to any lethal methods on these guys. You're better off to get rid of the carpenter bees, replace your soffits and fascia with hardy plank, and you won't have the carpenter bees. Kitty cats, I, I love them. And um, I do have an adopted one that's an indoor outdoor, the rest of mine are indoor. So just be aware that if you have one that has a very strong prey instinct, uh, they, can, they can be a problem. Not to mention the fact that they do use people's gardens as their litter box. So uh, not everybody loves them, unfortunately. Chipmunks can cause a lot of problems. They'll chew on a lot of stuff. 
uh, and you'll attract snakes with them. So try to get the, the bird food and that kind of stuff away from the house and you'll probably notice fewer snakes. Beavers, unless you have a pond, it's probably not an issue or a stream, but these guys can do a lot of destructive damage by taking down the trees to create their, um, their uh, beaver dams. And they are a keystone species, but most people in suburbia don't want all the trees cut down, so they opt for lethal control. Just understand that if you hire a company to come out, they're going to kill it because that's the law in Georgia. So think, think hard before you do that. And invasive, the snakehead, as I mentioned again, uh, this guy can eat whatever fits in its mouth. And so that's most game fish species. And um, DNR does want to know where these guys are. So if you see any, let them know. I gave you some different ways to get in touch with DNR and they will come out and eradicate. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll use rote known, which uh, can either temporary, temporarily, um, if you get them out quick enough, stun or kill a fish population. And that is it. So I'm only a few minutes over, which is awesome. Um, I did kind of whiz through that, but that's okay. Like I said, I've recorded this. So um, you can go back and check out some of the QR codes excuse me, and um, this QR code will take you to our website and you can see more about the classes that we offer and that kind of thing. I don't think we have a lot uh, going up in the next quarter or so, but um, this is going to be where they would be listed if you want to uh, sign up. So um, with that, if anybody has any questions, you can type it in the chat box and I'll read it. Um, I'll put in there where, so if you're not familiar, I know there's some uh, emails I did not recognize. Metro Master Gardener on YouTube. So the Metro Master Gardener channel on YouTube is where I put these recordings and you can check this out over there along with the other ones that I have. Um, you know, hopefully I'll like the uh, QR codes a little bit more versus a link. I could put a video in here, but this saves a little bit of time because you can go back at, on your, at your leisure and check out the videos that I had. Um, Shirley, otherwise known as my mom, has said that we just harvested sweet potatoes and there were a lot of potatoes that were not on. Um, yes, and that is difficult. How do you prevent that next year? Um, there aren't very get a cat for inside the uh, the enclosed area of the community garden um that's a tough one because you're excluding the predators that would eat those uh there's not really any good place um to take there's not a really good way they've, they've got a perfectly protected area um would an outdoor cat be useful to turn to voles yes uh, just note that they also can and will eat songbirds and other things. So I will tell you, I don't have very many chipmunks. I don't have very many voles or any other rodents in and around my house because I have uh, a cat that I rescued from my neighbors. Um, he's getting a little bit older now and he doesn't hunt as much as he used to. So I have more now than I used to, but they are and can be quite effective at keeping the the rodents at bay um plant skid granules stopped a bull issue i had last year okay well if you've had mm -hmm. success mm -hmm. i never heard skid granules you can pull up your chat box and that's where i'm reading all of this from plant plant skid there's a spray S -S -K -Y -D. In yeah yeah. So if you pull up your chat box, look down at the bottom of your screen and hover over that and you should get a little bar that pops up and there's an option to click on chat. And if you click on that, you'll get a little pop up that will have all of this. Anything anybody's talking about or listing will be in there, including the Metro Master Gardener channel. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing here. Go back to my. Yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully that has helped 
some folks, wildlife, it almost always comes down to what are their needs? And if you take away what their needs are, then they go away because there's no reason for them to hang around. If they don't have food, if they don't have water, if they don't have a place to live, they're going to go somewhere else. If you harass them with the motion detector, or sorry, with the motion activated sprinkler, uh, if you harass them with Canada geese, that was, I should have gone into a little bit more about that. If you live around a pond, um, geese don't like going under things to move, and they like to be able to move directly from the water to the grass and they want to graze. So if you plant plants or put um, some type of a, a, a rope or something um, about 12 inches high, they'll stay off your property because they don't like going under that. It's too short and they can't hop over it. So when you're trying to get rid of nuisance wildlife, it almost always comes down to uh, psychological games that you're playing with them. Uh, you know, we try to do what we can to let them live their life and enjoy their life. We just don't want them doing it in our lawn and our house and our garage. Um, so, you know, if you have questions, just know you can give us a call at extension and we'll give you some really good methods for um, helping them move on. So with that, I am pretty much done. So one last ask for questions and otherwise, um, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off and everybody can go enjoy the rest of their evening. Last call. All right, <laughs> thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.